Sorry, guys, we had the age-old Zoom problem. Welcome, everybody, to, to our panel event tonight. I was on mute, as you guys are all probably used to hearing. Welcome to our panel event, My Voice, My Census, My Future. This event is hosted by Salt Lake City Government in partnership with Youth City and the Emerald Project. We're here tonight to talk about the census. So as you all know, September 30th is the last day to respond to the census. So we have our all youth panel here tonight to talk about the importance and impact of, of responding to the census. So before I go ahead and introduce them today, I wanna let you all know um, that we do have an ASL interpreter here, Soraya Step. go ahead and wave hello. Awesome. Um, and just, um, I also want to go ahead and let you guys know that tonight, as part of our event, we will also be um, featuring a communication tree as part of our Get Out the Count effort. So our goal is to reach households in different languages and ones active and not active on social media. So we're going to challenge everyone watching to text three of your friends or family members, check in to make sure that they've completed the census, and share information with them on how to participate. You can also challenge your friends and family to themselves, like reach out to three of their friends. Um, three of their friends um, or extended family in their circle. Um, we have it, we made it pretty easy. So if you can actually just go in and copy paste one of the short messages from the Facebook comment section. If your community does speak another language, just like mine does, go ahead and feel free to translate it and send it out. Um, I know at Emerald Project, we've done quite a few video um, videos for our own communities that do speak second languages. So we know like for those of you out there who do speak multiple languages, please, please, please feel free to translate that and send that out to them. Um, and with that, we'll go ahead and introduce our amazing panel. Um, I'll go ahead and start. I'll be your moderator tonight. My name is Satine Tashkizi, and I'm the executive director of the Emerald Project. Um, and I will go ahead and turn the time over. Hi, um, my name is Emma Stoffik. Um, I am a Bosnian American. Um, I am on the Emerald Project, I'm the Director of Outreach and Sponsorships. Um, and just a little bit about Emerald Project. Emerald Project is a local nonprofit whose mission it is to combat the misrepresentation of Islam. Um, and I will go ahead and stop there. All right, and I'm Corinne Rogers. I am a current University of Utah student and a former Census Counts 2020 intern for the Salt Lake City Mayor's Office. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. It was a pleasure working with the census early in April during when this all started and working with the adjustment of things regarding the census. It's certainly been a hectic year. So I'm excited to get more participation and definitely reach out to youth. Hi, my name is Gregoria Alegria. I am a junior at the University of Utah as well as the intern for Youth City Government, a program that aims to educate and immerse high school students within the Salt Lake City area into government programs and teach them more about politics and government interactions. And yeah, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Arinda the Human. I go by Dati. Um, I'm a junior at West High. I'm a member of the Salt Lake City Youth Government Group I am the student board advisor for the League of Women Voters, and I serve on the Salt Lake City School Board. Wow, welcome to all you guys are some pretty accomplished young people on our panel. I'm really excited to have you guys. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Before we begin and before I start asking you a bunch of questions about the census um, so you can pass on some information to other young people as well as our community, I want to begin Emerald Style by asking a get to know you question. Um, so we'll go ahead and start with Ermina, but I want to know where is your favorite spot in Salt Lake City? Okay, I slightly prepped myself for this question because I always hesitate on where my favorite spot is. Um, but I'm going for um, every meetings, and it's like a co working space, and I love the views and everything about it. So I'm going to go ahead and go with Impact Hub. Impact Hub. Yeah, for the you who um, I think you you your voice broke a little bit, but I think Armina, you were talking about how at Emerald we have all of our meetings at Impact Up. We Armina spent like half of her life at Impact Up, so I don't think she she has much of a choice but to take that place. Um, awesome, Corinne. 
All right. I have to say, um, I always love to spend my mornings going to a nostalgia cafe in downtown Salt Lake, followed by a trip to the city library. I love to hang out there in the mornings. I show up ridiculously early for my classes. So that's a great way to just kind of take a moment to myself in the morning and enjoy the morning, the Salt Lake. Awesome. That's awesome. And I loved nostalgia as a college student because they were open all the way until midnight and like nowhere else was like that except the coffee garden. So absolutely excellent. Second, for sure. second that. Awesome. Uh, Dottie, where's your favorite place in Salt Lake City? Uh, my favorite place would also probably be the public library. I think it has a lot of secret spots that you can go and check out. So I really love it. Love that. Gregoria. I would say um, Le Madeleines, this cute little bakery right in downtown, right like next to the public library. It's this little spot where pastries are delicious. So I'm wherever the pastries are. That's awesome. I've actually never heard of that bakery. Thanks for sharing that. I'm excited to go check it out. Maybe we can start hosting more of our our meetings down there where there's at least some nice baked goods. Well, awesome. And I'll go ahead and answer as well. Um, I do not require that much time to come up with my answer. I love any part of Salt Lake City that has a beans and brews in it. I love ice mochas from beans and brews. I have one to two a day. Um, my favorite location is probably um, the one that's on 2100 South and 700 East. So it's probably close to Sugar House, Liberty Park. Love that. Awesome. All right. Well, welcome. So I'm going to go ahead and ask you guys some questions. Um, please feel free to chime in. Um, I know a lot of you do a lot of work in your own communities, and so your perspectives are really important. So please don't be shy. Um, the first question I want to ask is going to be for all of you, and we can go ahead and start with Gregoria. Um, I want to know what motivated you to participate in the 2020 census? Um, for me, I remember, well, I'm 21 right now, just turned 21. And I remember when I was really young, the last census happened and I lived in Texas. Um, and I remember people coming and knocking the door and being like, hey, you know, we're from the census. And it was just me and my grandma at the time. And for her, it was like a trouble, troubling situation because she didn't know English. Um, and she didn't live with us 24-7 but she was helping out a lot. And for her to kind of answer those difficult questions and kind of uh, respond to the census by herself and me like an 11 year old helping her, it was like, I had to kind of help her and be there for her and support her. So now this opportunity that I'm older and I understand, um, I wanna be able to help and interpret for Spanish speakers and volunteer in the community and be like, you know what? This is what's happening. We need to be a part of the census. Um, you know, get community um, community members involved and let them know that this matters and it's really important to fill this out because it has a it creates change and this is what we need to do. Awesome, Gregoria Corinne. I know you were a. Did you say you were a census intern? I was indeed. Um, I worked from January to May 1st on the census with the Salt Lake City Mayor's Office and the Census Counts Committee, and it was an awesome experience. I myself am hard to count. Um, my family and I, we rent. Um, we've always kind of been in that hard to count region of just socioeconomic status. All of those things contribute to making it harder to count because moving a lot and all of that kind of thing. And, really motivated me to get more involved in something that actually mattered a lot to me and the people that I know and the people I'm friends with. All of those things, very helpful and definitely one of the reasons that I was so passionate about the census. Um, and while we're on that topic, before we uh, move on, I wanna hear from all of you. I'm curious to pick your brain, Corinne. Tell me why the census is so, so important. Um, so the census is, incredibly important in that it provides so much funding to your local community. Um, basically, the census is a count of everyone and it allows your legislators to divert money to where there are people. That means that any place that doesn't get a lot of counting won't get as much money as a place that gets a lot of counting. So if you're in a community that's not 
counted as often, it's really important to get counted and make sure that funding is in your community to build things like schools, all of that kind of stuff. Those are very important to communities and 100% something that everyone should take the census for. Thank you so much, Karen. That, that definitely sheds a lot of light. Dottie, what motivated you to participate in the census this year? Um, so I helped my parents fill out the census this year. And um, I think what really motivated me to help out with the census is that it's a very small action that has huge rippling change. Um, and as Kareen said about the legislators, um, it's a very small amount of time to invest into taking the census itself and it creates a very long lasting change for the betterment of both yourself and your community. That's awesome. Well, shout out to you for helping your parents fill out the census. Um, just as a reminder to anyone in the audience who's watching, it, helping your parents out with the census is pretty typical. I actually helped out mine this year as well. Um, I know that all the people on our team did the census on behalf of their families as well. So thank you for that. Um, uh, Gregoria, what motivated you to, to respond to the census this year? So can you repeat that? Were you talking to me? Oh, okay, sorry. I was just asking what motivated you to respond to the census this year? Um, for me, it was... Oh, I already... I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, yeah. I already asked you. I'm sorry. When I said Gregoria, I was totally talking about um, Ermina, but... Sorry. I just, I'm testing you, Gregory, you, you know? Yeah, I get it. Okay, um, I lost complete connection. My computer almost died. I thought I had to buy a new computer for a little bit, but I'm back. Um, the reason that I participated in the census is that I wanted to make sure that I was counted and that my family was counted um, because this comes around once every 10 years. Um, and there's a lot of misconceptions around the census and there's a lot of fear um, around it and people don't want to participate. So um, with Emerald Project, we really wanted to make sure that um, we saw the need for us to fill it out on behalf of our families and make sure that we were counted. But we also saw a need within our communities. So we posted videos in different languages to make sure that at least that language barrier was met. Um, and when you participate in the census yourself, like when you go through it, you can then answer questions that are really simple. Like how many questions does it have? Less than 10. Um, how do you fill it out? You can do it online. So I think the reason I took the census is so I could better educate myself and therefore my community. Thank you so much, Armia. That's a great segue. I'm curious to know, um, for those of you who did help your families fill out the census, um, where I know you did when you were back when you were even 11 years old. Were there, I know I everyone mean, I talked a little bit about language barriers. Can you guys talk about your experience with language barriers with your family? And did you help out anyone in your community fill out the census? And what was that like? I'll, I'll speak on this just a little bit more. Sorry to come back to myself. Um, but I think when it comes to language barriers, um, it's a difficult thing because you want to make sure that everyone's counted and the census is when it comes to different languages that it's offered in, it is pretty inclusive. However, there are a lot of languages that aren't there. So it's dependent on community organizations like the Emerald Project and others to really translate those videos and translate that message and send it for um, their community. But also the thing that's really important about language is like my family has a language barrier. So when conversating with my family, I almost have that language barrier as well. So Google Translate is your best friend, like as a first generation um, American, like don't be ashamed to use Google Translate to help translate stuff to your native language. Um, like through the education that I received, like my mom talked about it to her sister and her sister's like, we didn't fill out the census. So now I'm gonna go over there and help them figure it out too, just because we talked about it. 
That's awesome, Edwina. Thank you for, for sharing. One thing I actually wanted to add to that with, you know, the, the videos, you know, like Edwina said, a lot of um, sometimes the census can't disseminate the languages or they can't reach those communities. After all, if we're hard to count, then it's going to be hard to reach us to get that information in a different language to us to begin with if we can't even get the census out, right? Um, and so when Edwina talks about like the burden being on like some of these community organizations, our organization is not good at like our job is, you know, our mission statement does not include translation services. Like we don't have a lot of the resources that we needed just on our team to be able to do that. And so all of us like sat down with our families, our extended families, um, our professors, uh, people who are experts in our language to get that done. Uh, so it's sometimes it's not as like official as, you know, turning to an organization that provides these services. We really kind of have to, to help our own communities and, and and get that work done anyway. Um, Gregoria, can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, um, like I said in my introduction, you know, I was very young the last time and I'm bilingual. Spanish was my first language. And for me to be able to be able to translate for my grandma and be able to make sure that she not only did she understood, but like comprehend the questions and make sure that I was also translating it correctly for an 11, a 10 year old, it's hard and it's difficult. So, you know, now that I'm older and that I'm part of like this organization, I'm part of youth city government, where we can spread the word to our members, to um, our participants, to our, our media. It's very important for us to be able to acknowledge that there are people out there who don't understand and there are there they are already like um not they're like i mean what is what is the issue you know they're like they're not animated and they're they don't it's a troubling thing because not only do you have to like um i mean they said it's like the amount of languages that people speak and the amount of languages that are provided by the census it's very minimal compared to how many languages and how diverse salt lake city is utah you know um so for us to be able to like have organizations like the city government or like um, the Emerald Project, who are providing, we're taking our time and we're taking our 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 program and like taking it to the streets to help these people and to spread the word. You know, the first thing I I did as soon as like the census was like, okay, let's let's fill it out. It's the program's running. I was like, okay, mom, let's fill it out. Let's make sure. Let's all sit down. And I'm gonna read you the questions and I'm gonna make sure you understand. And, you know, I ended up doing that for her friends and um, being able to be that resource and be that resource. That's amazing. And I wish we could capture, like, if we could do a video of like all these young people across the country silently doing this for their families and their communities. Um, I know I've seen Edwina firsthand translate things for a family and it's like, you know what, this is what makes America what it is. You know what I mean? So I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, before we keep moving along here, it appears that our sign language interpreter has been deprioritized off of the off of the screen. So if you don't mind turning on your mic for just a second, it'll it'll populate. Oh, did it work? Oh, perfect. It works. Thank you, sorry. Awesome. Um, well, um, Corinne, so tell us a little bit about like, um, like, I mean, I know you mentioned earlier about hard to count communities and you said, you know, I think it's really important because as a hard to count community, it's important that we're represented as well. What makes young people a hard to count community? So the reasoning that young people are a hard to count community is one, they're highly mobile. Um, hard, hard to count just means that you're literally like, they don't know where you are, where to send the information, or if they do get the information to you, they're unsure if you'll fill it out. There's a couple complications for college students, especially that make it hard. One, they're usually renters and usually highly mobile renters that are switching from place to place, usually with multiple roommates, some of which are legal, some of which are not. And all of those kind of things make it very hard. And then we also have the aspect of student housing in which you get counted by your university. Usually, I believe that's how they do it at the U. They count you by a person basis. And then again, with the rental issue, it gets confusing on who counts, why do they count and all of that. And just as a general note, if 
anyone living in the house at the time of April 1st, it's hard to think back that far, but anyone who is living in the house at April 1st, they will be counted at that residence. So just make sure that they're counted, make sure your friends have been counted. It's okay to file over again, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> so yeah. So team, I want to hop in because um, Corinne mentioned um, something regarding uh, citizenship status. And I just wanted to make sure to clarify for all the viewers watching and for the community out there that no information provided on the census can be used against you whatsoever. And there is no citizenship question on there. So that is another reason that a lot of people are afraid of taking the census. But the census is there to provide statistics to then get the resources that our community needs. So just know nothing can be used against you um, that you the information you provide on the census and it does not ask a citizenship question. Thank you for clarifying that for me that and I actually have a follow up question um, for you on that note. I know like there's a variety of different reasons why many Americans have been kind of nervous to, to respond to the census. Uh, one thing is the our own Muslim community has been really hesitant to to reach out to the census. I've actually talked to people and had to like talk them into responding. Um, so I know like um, someone told me like you know we're just you know, we're nervous about what they're going to use that information for. For are are our responses safe and secure? So can you talk a little bit about like what your message to the Muslim community might be? Yeah, my message to the Muslim community is. Don't fall for the fear mongering um, because that all of those statements being made are invalid and the federal law protects your answers on the census. Um, and not only that, no, no questions are asked regarding um, your identity or things of that sort, just your race and ethnicity, which that we also have a, sl a slight problem with that because a lot of Muslims, um, people from the Muslim community, don't feel like they're being accurately represented in the census because Middle Eastern and North African communities have to list that they're white. So what Emerald Project is promoting and what we're pushing out to our community is check the other option and write in your race or national origin because you deserve to be counted appropriately. Um, and for funds to be disseminated um, accurately and your community to be represented. So that, I guess, is my little spiel for um, the Middle Eastern and North African communities, the Muslim community in general. Um, there is a lot of fear around the census, but it is for statistics and it is to provide um, us with resources that a lot of our communities desperately need. Very good. Very good. Um, in fact, um, I do identify with the Middle East and North African community, so I actually checked other and wrote in Iranian for my family. So thank you for that shout out, Ermina. Um, Dade, talk to me a little bit about what has the experience been for you engaging with your community and your family with the census? Um, I know a lot of Asian American communities don't like to interact with government and policy work as much as other communities do. Um, and I know that um, a lot of communities don't take the census as seriously because it seems as like it's a very small action. The Asian community also has a very low voting rate when compared to other communities as well. Um, and so my message to the Asian community is that this makes a really big difference. And I know Asian communities are always about getting the most bang for your buck. So this is one way to really do that. Well, that absolutely 100% true. Um, um, I I thought for a second you were also going to slip in that like the Asian community also wants their kids all to go to medical school. I was like waiting for like the full comprehensive. Person. <laughs> yeah, it's also there. <laughs> 100%, yeah. Um, perfect. So I know some of you kind of talked a little bit about like what, why you responded to the census and, and how important it was to you to get your family respond. Can you guys talk a little bit about the, you know, what uh, directly translates for the census? What are some benefits for these hard to count communities that they would not otherwise get if, if these hard to count communities don't respond? Start with um, Corinne. All right, I, I did a lot of research on this for sure. Um, so the census funds, things like SNAP, um, all of your like food related food stamps programs, um, WIC, um, it funds section eight housing, it funds your local university, your local public schools, 
all of that kind of stuff, local parks, it's basically supplies, I believe, one thousand um eight hundred, I think fifty dollars a year for every person that's counted for the next 10 years. That is a lot of money for your community and definitely something that you want to get in, especially if your community is kind of struggling with representation and getting those funds out to them. That's super important to make sure. I mean, I know that West Side only has one high school. No. One like a, a handful of elementary schools, one middle school and I think one high school. Definitely something that needs to improve, especially with the growing population out there. So that's one reason, major reason to get counted. Alegria? Yeah, you know, um, Karen made a great point. I think that's me living in the West Side. I think, you know, having a sister that goes to high school and a brother that's going to middle school, we need a lot more that are closer and accessible. As a college student, um, the census also helps determine how much funding goes into the Pell Grant and public transportation. And as college students, like me personally, I apply for FAFSA and Pell Grants like starting starting my freshman year. And I'm still like it, the help that it gives me to be able to go to college and pay for tuition is so amazing. Um, so, like, filling out the census has a lot, a lot to do with how much money and resources put into Pell Grants and FAFSA. Also, like, transportation, you know, I know as a college student and as a female, as a woman, and as a woman of color, I find it difficult to, you know, be able to feel safe taking public transportation and being able to be, like, rely on public transportation because of, like, times and which routes and everything. So making sure that routes are counted and uh, transportation is there and is reliable is so important. So fa um, filling out the census and counting how many people are in our community and live in all these areas is very important. It has a lot to do and contributes so much to transportation. And as college students and as like me living at home and going to school is has a lot to do with you know how am i going to get to the university of utah or how am i going to pay for tuition or books and census is completely correlated to you know those things awesome thank you so much for joining us something else um Satine, that i also wanted to add is census data um there's been a lot of um the, the youth i feel like our generation and it happens quite often that every um generation and like the youth they really pick up and they say we want to vote we are we are against this and we're going to stand for what we believe for so there's a lot of energy in the youth to vote um and with the census now, we don't, we need to see that there's a direct correlation there because census data is used to, um, used by um, our government to redistrict. Um, and that means counting how many people are there and how many representatives are needed in the area. So if we want to be counted and make sure that our voice counts and that our vote counts and that our vote counts evenly, you need to fill out the census for that reason too. It's all very interwoven. And I know people are like, you need to register to vote. You need to fill out the census. Don't go outside, wear a mask. There are so many things, but this year is a really incredible, uh, incredibly important year. I shouldn't say incredible, incredibly important year. Um, and it can feel like there's a lot on our plate, especially as young people, school starting up. Um, and even, especially with being like a first generation American, you have to help your family out and do a lot of those things. but. Every little action helps um, and your community is going to reap the benefits of all the advocacy that you're doing in your community now. Awesome. Thank you so much, Edwina. And yes, by the way, while you're while you're doing filling out the census, don't forget to register, register to vote. You should also also vote as Edwina said. Uh, Donnie. Oh yeah, I was just gonna add on to what Ermina said. Um, Youth are very, very loud. Our community is very loud right now. We go and protest. We are very vocal about the fact that we want um, voting rights. But um, the important part is that while we are outside and while we are being loud, we back those up with the actions 
that our government has provided to us. And those are the actions that oftentimes can make just as large of a difference. And by filling out the census, you gain the numbers that are in your community. And then like Armina said, uh, we redistrict so that each district is proportional, um, as proportional as it can possibly be so that each area is accurately represented. And I know this should be ringing loud in the heads of Utah youth redistricting, please listen to that. Um, I know that's a really important thing that we're all thinking about and how to allocate um, resources to every community. So voting rights, um, taking the census, these are all ways to back up what is coming out of our mouths and how loud we're being about it. Excellent point, Dati. I didn't even I didn't even think about it from, from that perspective. Um, young people have been incredibly loud and engaged and vocal in, in the past, I would say, like recent months um, and year. But you're right, there aren't it is there are not as as many clear to action items that can make an immediate impact like the census can. And so if there's anyone who should be jumping on the census, it actually absolutely should be young people. Uh, my next question for you guys is tell me a little bit about like you know, you guys all interact with, with young people and there's a lot of young people out there who are, who are watching this panel and they're thinking like, you know, I'm busy, I go to school, I work, I to support my family, I'm juggling, juggling so many different things, wearing a mask, registering to vote, protesting. Um, what are so what is the like tell me about the ease and simplicity of, of responding to the census and what can they do after they respond to the census to help promote response in their communities? Um, so if you are busy, I know that I actually, I had my, um, we got the postcard. We were so busy with everything. Everyone in my household works pretty much. So my brother goes to school, all of that. We actually ended up losing our census card just in the rush of things. So we ended up just going online. It's super easy to fill out. You can go online phone, or if you get your, um, a printout in the mail, um, we didn't have our codes, so we just went online and then went in and filled in our address and and you can easily just drop jump on and fill out the census for everyone in your house. It's a bit difficult for us and I definitely had to help out because we live with my grandma, which means there's an extra level of trying to figure out what's going on. And so that's definitely something that you can do. It's super easy. It takes less than 10 minutes per person. It's really, really easy, honestly. It just takes a second to figure out and it gets quicker as you go on. <laughs> um, yeah, same. Um, we ended up like moving uh, during like right before the pandemic started. And so we also like lost all of our like information. So we heard it on the news when well, my mom was watching the news and it came up and they're like, okay, you know, um, don't forget, fill out, fill out the census and we're like, oh yeah, okay, we need to do that. And then again, you know, I saw on social media and then again, and I, I was like, okay, well, like I've been busy, I have work, I have this, I'm stressed. And one day I was sitting down on the couch and I was like, you know, mom, mom like, let's do it. We have like, it won't take us like not even 30 minutes. It's so easy. I went on my phone. I went to the website. I was like, okay, this is super simple. And you know, as said, it's only, it only gets easier as you get further into the questions. So it probably took us five minutes, not even 10 minutes max. And we got it done and it was easy, simple and fast. Awesome. It sounds like you guys, you guys both lost your postcard. When I got my postcard in the mail, I was so hyped. I like took it and I was like, mom, we got our postcard in the mail. And she's like, okay, what do you want me to do with it? I was like, don't worry, mom, I got you. So I handled, I handled the census and I just handled it. Um, awesome. We have a question from the community. Jeremy on Facebook it says if the, um, um, he asks, I submitted our multi-generation census online. I'd like to know if my family was counted. Anyone can go in as well. I'll go ahead and take it. Um, if you submitted it on my2020census.gov or 
went through the official 2020 census.gov website, it should be submitted. But something that I learned yesterday that I didn't know is there is no harm in resubmitting um, the census if you're not sure if it did. It's not like other governmental forms where it will count you twice or something like that. It won't. Um, it'll take one for your address. Um, and it's great that you included everyone in your home because there are a lot of multi-generational homes with the grandparents living and the parents and the grandkids. Awesome. Thank you so much for answering Jeremy's question. Um, I want to know how each of you, you guys are all like really active in your own communities. I mean, you must have kept in young people who didn't have time to do all of this. Um, I'm curious to know how have you guys individually actively act, active, advocating for the 2020 census um, with your respective communities, like like publicly, like outside of your families. Um, and how do you guys encourage your friends to do the same? Have you been having those conversations? And you're like, hey, Jessica, I'm going to need you to attend the census and meet your family. Here. Talk to me about what you guys have been doing that's been um, working. All right, I think I can go ahead and start this one. Um, personally, I am part of first generation students, formerly known as Beacon at the U, and I know that I did a presentation with Haley Leak, who runs the Complete Count Committee um, at the Salt Lake City Mayor's Office, and we brought a presentation to a bunch of first generation college students and work together to kind of bring that information out. We had um, kind of bilingual flyers so that everyone could explain exactly what was going on, even if they didn't quite speak English as their first language or anything like that, so that everyone knew what was happening and kind of what information they needed to know, why they needed to fill out the census and just overwhelmingly figuring that out and helping out with that. So, yeah. That's awesome, Karen. Dottie, how have you been um, working with your community? Um, I've been interacting with um, friends as well and asking them whether or not they've taken the census and just reaching out to um, other communities, especially West High students. And like Ramina said, um, eliminating the fear that surrounds the census. I think that has been a really vocal way um, that a lot of communities are being hurt by what is being said. and. Um, there's really no reason why you shouldn't be able to take the census. The census is there for you. And I think that's one of the most important points that I've been able to make. That's amazing. I really love that you mentioned like that, you know, it's not enough to just say, you know, hey, respond to the census, but you've been like debunking a lot of the myths, um, and trying to eliminate a lot of the fear around the census. That's that's amazing that you're like you've been addressing that. Edwina. Yeah, um, so with Emerald Project, um, we received a census grant to make sure um, that our Heart to Count community, which featured a lot of Heart to Count communities, um, that we were going to do everything we possibly could um, to engage um, our community. Um, we had a lot of different events scheduled. We were going to host um, census fill outs at different mosque locations. We were even gonna do one at the library just to make people comfortable and to get into them and offer them that. Well, then COVID-19 happened and we had a global pandemic. So we had to completely restructure what we were doing. So what we really are doing right now is pumping out social media content and pumping out videos. It's actually um, Emerald's it's actually census week at Emerald Project right now. So we have videos in Farsi videos in Arabic, videos in Bosnian, Spanish, Portuguese, um, just to make sure that we're disseminating as much information. But the other thing that um, it benefits when it's young people like us sending those videos to our community or sending them like the initial, hey, you should respond to the census, is it kind of makes it seem more, it lightens the load of the census being this big, scary thing because my my community knows me. They they trust me and they trust me to share information with them. So it's not only about like the language barrier. It's that person to person contact that they're getting. Um, and I think that that's you can't pay for that. You can't pay for trust and you can't build for the you can't pay for um, relationships that have been, been building for decades. 
So I think that's a really important thing um, that we do um, at Emerald. And that's what all of us are doing here when we engage, whether it be a text message that you've sent, you're a more familiar voice and you're not some government agency. That's amazing, um, Edwina. That's a really good point. I think, like, back to what Dottie was saying earlier with, like, you know, there's so much fear in our communities. I mean, just interacting with people that, I mean, we interact with on a regular basis who said, oh, like, you know, the, there's, like, a Muslim man, and, and I don't want to respond because they're going to find out, like, who we are, and then they're going to, like, come get us, you know? It's, it's really critical that we, we nip that in the butt. Um, but while Armina is on the topic of, of, of government agencies, um, I do want to give a shout out to the incredible workers at the census, the most underrated department in the United States government. Like there should be a holiday just for census workers. Um, our, like the contact that we know at the census, Ali Omran, I have never seen anyone fight as hard for the American public as I have seen Ali Omran fight. We, we love, thank you so much for all the work you do. And I know that's just the mindset and the culture of the census. So I'm really just, I just want to take a second and, and give like a moment and a shout out to our census workers, including Corinne. And I'll let you go, go ahead and go next off of that. Thank you. Wait. Yeah, for sure. Um, one thing like they are being retrained in a pandemic. They are trained to go door to door during a pandemic and have to learn a whole new like ground level of rules that they didn't ever have to learn. And they're they've all taken pledges to anonymity, making sure that that information is always safe and that that will never be disclosed to law enforcement, to the government, to ICE, to any of those institutions so that you will never have to worry about someone coming to your door because of the census that's like it's it would be a federal violation for them to break that code of confidentiality regardless of the information that they pro provide so that's a huge benefit if you ever need to convince someone that the census is safe for them is even the workers aren't allowed to tell any of that information to anyone about the census i mean it's super important um to note and they're working on the clock constantly because the census officially ends on September 30th. It is very close to the end of the counting and we want to get as many people in and as, and as little time as possible and they are working around the clock to facilitate that and it's just really beneficial. For sure. And actually, we have another question from our audience, Corinne, if you want to go ahead and answer it. So Shayna on Facebook um, asks, what happens if you don't fill out the census by the September 30th deadline? If you don't fill out the census by the deadline, um, you get into kind of a tough spot because it is something that's very hard to um, get in. That's why we are encouraging everyone to get it in before that deadline because you do kind of miss out. Um, and if you feel like anyone you know or anyone you um, haven't, like, who hasn't taken the census yet, um, is struggling to find out a way to take the census, encourage them to look online. If they don't have access to internet, you can also use it through the phone. Encourage them to use your internet, those kind of things. Make sure to try and facilitate that connection. Make sure to get your friends counted because even if you're like, well, I don't live there, that money helps them. And I personally like helping my friends. So I think it's very important to try and get everyone in before that deadline. It makes it a lot easier to, work through. Right, for sure. And it looks like, um, and additionally, for for um, households that don't participate, they can be counted via a proxy survey and administrative records will be used to complete the census for that household. Um, the census taker will ask neighbors for household for the household information, and then the final step is to use the administrative records to complete the census. Um, thank you so much for um, Corinne for for mentioning that. Um, like you said before, it you know just it's it's better to just do it before than to wait until after. Like you said, um, can anybody talk a little bit about all the different ways you can respond? So I know we've talked about go to you know twenty twenty census dot gov. What are some alternative um, methods? 
if the kind census worker comes to your door, take the time to answer their questions. Um, it's really rough right there. I actually had applied to be a census worker um, right before the pandemic hit. Um, and I was going to do it. I don't know. What, I, I just wanted to do it to get some experience on what the census is like and really dive in. Um, so really be kind to those people because they're doing work um, to benefit the community. So when they come to your door. Also, I want to mention the um, proxy count. Um, yes, like so you will be counted in some sense there and like they may ask your neighbors, but your answers are better than anyone else's answers for you. So if you can, take it by September 30th. Um, yes, and I actually do want to add on to that as a MENA identifying American myself. Um, I know we talked a little bit earlier that if you know you do identify um, as an individual who traces their origins back to the Middle East or North Africa, um, and by the way, you can Google and there's a list of, list of countries online um, if you're not sure. Um, but the goal is, is if you were to check other and write in what your race or national origin is, is in 2030, what we're crossing our fingers for is to obtain a box that's just for MENA Americans. Right now, um, if as an Iranian, if I go off of just what the census is, I have to check the box that's that's white. Um, but that's not very and that very accurate representation of my community, and it diverts a lot of funding from from communities that do originate from Middle East and North Africa. So, for those of you who are watching or know someone who is of Mena origin, Middle East or North African, please encourage them to respond today and to check other and write in um, their information. Um, awesome. And then it looks like we have a texting tree going on. Uh, do one of you want to take the lead on what the instructions are for our viewers? I think I can go ahead and take the lead on that. Um, so a texting tree, um, is basically you text three of your friends about the census, where to take it online by phone. Um, or by mail. And honestly, if you haven't gotten the mailer yet, online or by phone works just fine. Um, it would be my2020census.gov online. And then a phone you can call. They also have um, options for those who are um, hearing impaired. So th that's, that is an option. Um, so you can do 1844330. 2020. And then um, you can have that opportunity to get your friends to participate and hopefully everyone that you know has, if they haven't, or if they don't know if they have, encourage them to just do it again. It's easy. They have a um, system for automatically removing a double count. So it's certainly a wonderful way to get counted. Awesome, Corinne, thank you so much for sharing that with our instructions. This is going to be my new go-to census whiz. Um, thank you so much for, for like, having all of this information. Um, so let's have actually have, oh, before we demonstrate our text tree, we have one last question. Um, I want to know, and this is for all of you, so where do you see yourself in 10 years? And what question would you like included on the 2030 census? And we will start with Dottie. Um, I'm not exactly sure where I see myself in 10 years. In 10 years, I'll be 26. Um, I hope that we have some serious reforms and that all communities of all races and all colors uh, will be happy together and we'll all be working to a better future. I don't know exactly what I envision for my future, but um, I'm really excited to have that coming up for me. Um, and then as for a question that I would include on the 2030 census, I think it, I know it would be a lot of effort and it's probably unreasonable, but I thought it would be cool if we could have a blurb box where people could write what they feel um, and their recommendations or something they want to see just so that the government can really, I, it'll be a lot of perspectives, but it will also give the opportunity for um, a lot of people to give their more nuanced perspective on how they feel. Wow, that's actually not a bad idea. It's like one giant feedback loop back to the, to the US government. I would be so curious to read 
plus 300 million plus one accelerated income zero. Also, Dottie, I'm really excited for you to turn 26 in 10 years. I'm turning 26 in 90 days. So you have a lot of fun ahead of you. It's all around Jack. Well, happy early birthday. Thank you. Um, Gregoria, where do you see yourself in 10 years? And what would you like to see on the coin for census? Um, 10 years, um, I'll be 31 and getting my career, just being ready in my career and setting in and probably traveling. Um, there's a lot of countries that I want to visit, a lot of cultures that I want to get to know and a lot of people that are out there. Um, so I for sure would be see myself traveling a lot, working a lot because I want to be a lawyer. Um, I also see myself in contact with my community members and staying in contact and making sure I keep passing the word on any, um, you know, programs, resources and things like that. Um, and a question that I think that I would hope that would be included in the 2030 census would be um, to include all these other languages that aren't being represented in the census right now. As we've heard from our speakers today, there are so many languages and ethnicities and races that aren't being counted and that aren't included in the census. And I think that's something that really needs to change. And that's something that hopefully um, the tip you guys gave today um, by you know pressing the button other and adding your ethnicity or your race, um, hopefully that will get counted and that will be added in the next um, in the next census in 2030. So that should be something that should definitely be implemented, not just given three options, four options, and having you forced to choose one of those three. So, yeah. That's awesome. We're Gloria. Good luck to you in law school. All right, Edna. Um. I don't know specifically like where I see myself in 10 years. Um, I just graduated from the University of Utah with my bachelor's in political science and minor in sociology. Um, so, and hopefully one day I will have a good paying job that I am respected at. But there is one thing that I know for certain and that is that I will continue to be involved in my community. Um, in my in smaller communities, there's often not too many voices that are speaking with and communicating that information to governments. Um, so I know that I will always be doing that, whether it's with Emerald Project, whether it's with my Bosnian um, local mosque, um, wherever it may be, I know I'm going to be advocating for the rights of my community. Um, and then for the census 2030 question, I mean, I'm going to pick one. We've been pushing hard. We may as well try and get it in 2030, and that would be to have uh, more inclusive options on the race or national origin, because we really, really, really need to um, respect diversity um, in the United States, and the United States is very diverse, um, and unfortunately, those few options don't represent that accurately, um, and hopefully one day they will. Thank you so much, Arvina. Corinne. Yeah, I mean, just real quick to second that, um, what Armina said about um, kind of more race and recognition. I know that some of my friends have um, kind of indigenous or Native American identities that they identify with, and it's really hard to find yourself just accepting the broad category when there's so many different, like, cultural differences between every tribe in um, the U.S. So that's a one big thing. Um, in 10 years, though, I see myself, one, at 29, um, and also uh, graduated from the U, um, looking to get a place with my mom. Um, so definitely excited for that, actually buying a place, escaping rental. Um, but um, I think the question, the biggest question that I'd want to see added to the census is more about the socioeconomic status of the people who are um, being counted. Um, it's really hard sometimes is because the money isn't directly allocated to the communities that are struggling the most or maybe have the most need of those resources, not just necessarily the highest numbers. And I think more 
information on the socioeconomic status of those individuals could really help get the money where it needs to go the absolute most. Thank you so much, Corinne. Good luck to you on the side of the White House. Um, and with that, um, I want to take a moment and just um, have a volunteer on our panel demonstrate um, the text tree for our viewers. Let's just show us. I'll go ahead and volunteer to do it. Um, so basically, I'm just going to copy and paste this message in um, to three people in my phone. I'm going to do my sister-in-law, my cousin, and another cousin. And I'm going to let them, I'm going to provide them with the information um, to make sure that they fill out the census um, on my2020census.gov. I'm going to give them the phone number and also give them a respond now message that they can text because if you text respond now to 313131 you will get directed to the correct site so just sending that message and asking them to um, send it to three more people will honestly add up if everyone keeps doing it it was like back in the day you know when you would get one of those messages that would say like um i love you you're recognized send this to three other people in your phone book you love you guys know what I'm talking about. But yeah, it's kind of like that, but you're telling people to do the census. So go ahead um, and text three people and ask them to send it to three more and make sure you provide the right info. And I think we'll try and drop it in like the comment below or somewhere in the live feed just to make sure that people have accurate information. Awesome, thank you so much, Armina, for, for doing that and for demonstrating that for us. Um, and this is just a final call. Remember the census is coming up soon. I think we're at like 15, 14 days off until the census. Is that right? 14 days until this last day of the census. So make sure to respond sooner than later. Um, and for those of you out there who are renters, my fellow, well, I guess not my fellow anymore. For those of you who are out there who are renters, college students, um, and young people, please go ahead and fill out the census online at my2020census.gov. You can call 1-844-330-2020. Or you can also fill out the census by mail. Um, our 2020 census is a chance to be seen, heard, and counted. Um, especially for those of you who are in hard to count communities, this is a chance for you to step up and represent. Um, and also for those of you who haven't been represented on the census, um, there are some tools like the other box you can use to finally uh, work towards getting us um, a box in the future. Thank you to our panelists for joining and thank you to the city of Salt Lake City for hosting us and to Emerald Project and Youth City for partnering. Awesome, thank you for having us.